Um, the good news is you're in the right place, because we've got three fantastic talks coming up, three great speakers, all on the topic of Umbraco 9 and 10. And we're going to start with Tom Searle. He's, the solution, he's a solutions architect and head of development at Cold Banana. And he's going to be talking to us about high-performing websites with Umbraco 9. So please give him a warm Umbraco welcome. Right. Hello, everybody. Hope everyone had a lovely lunch. Um, yeah, thank you for joining me. Um, uh, it's been a fantastic week so far. We've had some really good talks. And uh, you know, hopefully I can add some, uh, some, something to that. Uh, and it's great to be able to do this talk uh, in front of you, face to face. Uh, usually, I'm able to kind of hide behind a camera, and uh, you'd only be able to see like this bit of me. So uh, yeah, I'm just really glad that I wore my trousers today. Um, yeah, my name is Tom Sell. I'm a head of development at uh, an Embraco Gold Partner agency based in Bournemouth, UK. Uh, we've been using Embraco pretty much since the inception of the agency. Um, and whilst Embraco is not everything that we do at Cold Banana, it's certainly uh, my first choice of CMS. Um, so it's great to be able to combine my two uh, favorite things, working with Embraco and over engineering the heck out of it. Oh, my thing's not working. Hold on. Never mind. Go old school. So, performant websites. Um, what is a performant website? Uh, I believe um, it can be captured in these, uh, these two statements. It's, um, a performant website is one that you know, implements best practices for performance. Pretty, pretty obvious. Um, but it's also one that can handle uh, demand, thank you, uh, above and beyond uh, what was originally intended. And uh, this is something that I believe is, is kind of the, our duty of developers. Uh, it's to anticipate how a website is going to grow, how our application is going to grow over time and build accordingly. Having no luck with tech today, no mind. OK, so why Embraco? Um, I've been working with Embraco for a little while now. And uh, I found it to be very, uh, a very accommodating platform uh, for building in the way that I want. Um, obviously, you get the features of a content management system. Um, but it doesn't have too many opinions on uh, how things must be done. And uh, this has allowed me to use it to design uh, performant builds uh, with Embraco as at the core. Uh, so what are we going to cover in this session? Um, firstly, I'm going to uh, discuss what we need to ooh, it's gone uh, what we need to prepare to set us off on set us off on the right foot uh, for building performant websites. Uh, then I have a few. Um, Areas where I often see quick wins for performance, um, and these can really push your uh, page speed and your kind of user experience uh, with the minimum amount of effort. Uh, I'm then going to uh, dive into some of the tech that we've adopted to use alongside Embraco, uh, technologies like headless and serverless functions. And this is where we're going to start thinking about designing our software with the idea of performance in mind. Finally, uh, I'm going to show you one of the sites we launched earlier this year um, and as a demonstration of uh, the result of making a performant website using Embraco 9. Cool, let's get into it. Um, if you're building uh, websites, especially for performance, uh, you need to build in some form of analytics. To make meaningful improvements to your application performance, you need to know everything about how your application is running now and in the past. If you're running, uh, sorry, if you're guessing at where your application is underperforming or only listening to your customers um, when, when they are telling you things are wrong, uh, you're going to be missing the full picture. In my experience, once you start to hear from customers about, uh, you know, bad page performance or uh, applications that they can't access, you've already started losing engagement from your less vocal users. 
So at the very least, um, I would make sure that you're able to track and monitor these things. First up, you need to be able to read, search, and run queries on your logs. And for that, I don't just mean your Umbraco logs, which is obviously quite nice to search these days, but I also mean your dependent services and also the uh, sessions that people are running in their browsers. Can you receive the logs and the errors that they're getting as well? Um, you need to be able to measure the, perf the response times of your web pages, again, both on the server and in the browser. You need to be able to give context to errors. Um, so what I mean by that is not just getting the you know, splat of what your errors are, but what services were being called that happened before that, and what, uh, what kind of logic flow led to those errors happening. And finally, you need to be able to view the dependencies from within your project. You know, what third-party services are you, running, like, are you hitting? Are your SQL statements running slow, for example? Um, for us, this is the tool we use, this is Application Insights. Many of you are probably very familiar. Um, from here, we can pull all the metrics we need um, to make a decision around where to focus our efforts for performance. It's worth noticing, uh, noting at this point that, obviously, Application Insights is an Azure service, and a lot of the things I'll talk about today are Azure-focused. Um, but you know, there are other alternatives, um, and you can even do offline solutions for a lot of these things. We've had some luck with uh, Sentry for on-prem analytics. Um, so yeah, these big picture analytics tools are especially useful when you start pulling uh, in data and um, use cases from uh, other services. Uh, so you can evaluate how well the different dependencies in your application are performing and uh, identify areas of improvement. So now, once you have all that data, uh, you need to know uh, all the data you need to know on how well your website's performing. It's time to take a look at how we can start to improve on our performance. I split this section into uh, common areas that uh, performance leaks inside Umbraco and uh, opportunities for improvements in the front end performance, mainly around page speed. And yeah, before I get into it, I want to just shout out the uh, Umbraco documentation contributors. There's a really fantastic page on common pitfalls with working with Umbraco um, that some of these things are, are based on. And it's definitely an article I wish I read you know, years ago before I started falling into said pit holes. So first tip, uh, Umbraco content is not for storing volatile data. It's a CMS. It's not a data repository. Um, this uh, is definitely something that I have done in the past. and. It's tripped me up. We had a, I think it was just a blog style site, content driven, and we wanted people to be able to add comments to that blog and vote on other people's comments. We wanted members to be able to interact in that way. And we were storing those comments and we were storing that, those votes inside Umbraco. But what we found was as people started increasing the amount they were interacting with the site, we were getting data inconsistencies. You know, vote numbers were coming back incorrectly. And also, we were basically ruining how the new cache was working. And the performance was uh, understandably quite bad. So our solution at the time um, for this, I believe we just created a uh, separate table, a separate, um, yeah, set to separate uh, repository for these comments and the uh, votes. And uh, we just tracked them against the idea of the blog article but importantly, we kept it separate from the Umbraco processes, which allowed Umbraco to do its thing. Another tip is to be kind to examine. Examine is obviously a very powerful tool, and uh, you can use it to search against Umbraco content, members, or even custom data that you input it yourself. But when you use examine for custom data, you have to be careful with how you treat it. Otherwise, you could end up ruining the performance of your site. Essentially, there are two things you have to remember. Firstly, you want to avoid um, doing too much logic when you're populating your index. Um, 
if you're adding any kind of lookup for your data, that function is going to run every single time you add things to your index, and you want that process to be as fast as possible. Um, I've seen sites where another developer um, wanted to use examine search to um, search within a set of like pretty volatile data, data that changed very often. And I think the result of that was an index that took over five minutes to generate, and we were trying to ask it to regenerate every couple of minutes, which obviously didn't work. So the solution there was uh, to kind of create a diff of the items that needed to be changed. And instead of asking uh, examine to rebuild from scratch every time, we, took, uh, we you know, added and removed items uh, accordingly. Cool, so that's it for kind of a couple of backend improvements that you can uh, apply. Um, again, I would uh, very much encourage you to take a look at that documentation. There's some really good things in there for um, performance opportunities when working with Embraco. Next up, uh, I have a couple of opportunities uh, in the front end. Again, these things are basic around uh, page speed and you know, how quickly your users can interact with your, your application. You probably didn't know this, but there's a tool called Google Lighthouse. Um, but this is a really good tool for kind of finding um, opportunities for improvement of performance on the front end. Um, I'd very much encourage you to um, delve into it and look at what, the, what they search for and what kind of uh, insights they would give you, rather than just reacting to how it's displaying your current metrics, because uh, there's some really good insight in there to you know, what um, you should look out for when you're building new sites. OK, one thing that I see uh, very often in sites is render blocking scripts. Uh, I can't count how many times a client has come to us and said, you know, our page speed is taking a hit. We've, you know, we're deranking in, uh, in Google and seeing if there's anything we can do about it. So we take a look at the website, and there's you know, three user session trackers. There's a pop-up cookie scripts and a chat widget. They all load in, and uh, they've all been added to the website, usually through Google Tag Manager. Um, now, I appreciate that these third-party tools are great ways of adding features to your site without necessarily in, uh, needing much more development. And uh, knowing how your users are interacting with your site is important. You know how much I like metrics. Uh, but you've got to be careful. You're not going to be able to improve your user experience uh, by forcing your customers to wait 10 seconds for your page to load every time. Uh, and if this is a problem for you as well, there are a couple of things you can do. For third-party tools, uh, make sure you are using deferred script loading. Um, so this will you know, tell the browser to uh, prioritize rendering out your page and getting the important things out before executing these scripts um, at the end. Um, for, the, for analytics, uh, I would fully recommend taking a look at server-side analytics. It's become a lot more popular recently. Um, there, are much more lightweight in the browser on the client machine and will you know, avoid slowing down your page speed. The balance there is that it takes a lot more developer time to get that set up, and you kind of have to, it's a bit more manual. It's much easier just to drop in a script at the top of your page. OK, my next bit of advice is to make sure that the raw files that you are using are um, as small as physically possible. Fortunately, a Mbraco makes this pretty simple for you. Um, the biggest uh, culprit for massive, massive files are images. Uh, obviously, we want to be serving up the highest quality images that we can, but we often see you know, images that are thousands by thousands of pixels wide being sent over the wire, only to be rendered in a you know, 300 by 300 pixel box. If that's a problem, uh, what you need to do is you need to be running it through uh, Image Cropper built into Umbraco. Uh, you can then pull out the image in exactly the size that you need it, massively reducing that file size and uh, the time it takes to download your website. Uh, one trick we found useful is um, when 
we're, especially when we're using Embraco headlessly, is to use the media queries to dynamically request uh, images in the exact size and ratio that you want, um, rather than having to you know, preemptively make crops for them. And yeah, it's going to help. So another trick um, for images and all other static assets is to make sure that you have HTTP2 turned on. Um, normally, you don't have to do any additional work for this. As soon as you add an SSL certificate to your website, you're going to have, uh, if, if you're using a you know, modern hosting framework, they will turn on uh, HTTP2 for you. And uh, what, what that does for you is, um, so this is an example of traditional, I guess, loading. It's going to grab a request and pull each individual file and load it in your browser with HTTP2. One request is made, and that kind of network traffic gets optimized, and all your assets come along uh, in one group, and they can run in parallel. It doesn't change the rendering of the page, so you, yeah, you don't have to worry about um, a different experience. OK, um, another opportunity uh, to improve your user experience and your page speed is to add a CDN to your site, Content Deployment Network. Uh, these days, it's ridiculously easy to set yourself up with a Cloudflare CDN. Um, I believe it's just a couple of clicks to make sure you've got the orange cloud, and uh, all your static assets uh, will be you know, distributed to servers around the world. The idea being, the closer your customers are to your server, to your assets, the shorter time it's going to take for them to download them. Um, in preparation for this talk, I went to one of our websites that has sat behind a Cloudflare CDN, and uh, without us even really knowing it, uh, we were saving almost a second in page speed, uh, simply by having it turned on and at no additional cost. Fantastic. So we've looked at some opportunities for improving the performance of websites. Um, these can apply to existing websites and are good things to keep in mind when you're building something new. But these uh, quick wins can only take us so far. Uh, at some point, we have to start looking at uh, our technology stack and our design decisions uh, in order to really be able to perform at a global scale. Uh, the first thing I want to highlight is the advantage we get just by using Umbraco. As I believe, um, we've had quite a big step forwards recently for performance, um, and maybe not in the ways you would expect. Uh, Umbraco, as you probably know, uh, runs on .NET 5, .NET 6 in the future, um, which has a bunch of benefits over the previous builds in .NET Framework. Uh, one of which is that we aren't limited to deployment on Windows anymore, which is great. Um, we have access to Docker um, and Docker-based hosting. And this is going to have a massive impact uh, if you want to start compartmentalizing your applications and using Umbraco as one part of a much larger application, much larger system. Uh, but on top of the infrastructure improvements, uh, we're also able to see raw performance improvements when using Umbraco. Uh, we, when using .NET, the new .NET language. Uh, and I've picked out some stats here at random. No. Um, so the first metric uh, I pulled were the benchmarks for uh, just around text processing. Um, the one example I pulled out was the two upper invariants. Uh, as you can see, the time to run this simple function uh, has gone down dramatically. And this reflects a lot of APIs in the .NET 5 and future. Um, that have you know, got better. We've also seen improvements in link, uh, networking APIs. And one thing that I, everyone probably uses it is the serializing and deserializing of uh, JSON data. Uh, in fact, with .NET 5, uh, we have the new library, the system.text.json library, catchy name. Um, I've heard, you know, we've had seen great improvement with how this performs, especially over very large um, you know, JSON strings. Uh, the whole thing was rebuilt for .NET 5. Um, no longer do we need to use Newtonsoft, but something you've got to be careful of is there were some features stripped out or not re-implemented um, so that 
it could be fast, so you need to you know, make sure it fits your use case before swapping over to the new library. OK, so we've been hearing a lot about uh, DXP compo uh, composed applications, headless. Um, and I think this shows that we're in the midst of a, a kind of paradigm shift uh, towards focused, specialized services um, that each work within one domain, and they work really well. Uh, and I think this is a good strategy to build for performance. Uh, the less noise you have in any one application, in any one service, um, the more that service is going to be able to focus on performing well in its own context. Um, I'll give you a scenario. So you have an e-commerce site. You're selling widgets. Um, in a couple of months, the new highly anticipated widget 2 is coming out. So you build a page where people can reserve their widget 2 uh, ready for launch day. Now, when widget 2 gets announced, uh, thousands come flocking to your reservation page. Uh, the service can't handle the extra load. And not only the reservation service starts underperforming, but your application as a whole starts underperforming. How do we deal with that? Traditionally, um, for Umbraco or other um, web applications, this is managed by loading requests over a variable number of servers. For example, if you're hosting on Azure Web App, uh, you can configure the website to scale out uh, whenever you meet a predefined threshold for load, usually CPU or something. This does create a reactive environment. This is going to increase and decrease uh, depending on the demand at that particular time. Fantastic. But, uh, and for a lot of use cases, that will serve you very well. If you know something big is going to happen, you can preemptively scale, which is good. But it has two um, drawbacks. Firstly, uh, speed. It takes time to take one server and load balance the traffic over two servers. You're, you know, Azure is going to have to spin up that application, and that whole time that that application is spinning up, you're, you know, you're under high load already. People are going to be losing uh, access. You're going to get drop requests. You're going to be losing engagement. Uh, the second is cost. Unsurprisingly, if you're running one server and you're paying for that server and you scale it up to two, for that entire time you're paying two times costs for your entire application. So what's the alternative? I'm glad you asked. An alternative solution um, is to be taking chunks of that application and dedicating them to particular areas of functionality. Uh, these services, you can decouple them from the rest of the, the, from the main application so that in times of increased demand, those services can scale independently to meet the requirements. By doing this, uh, you get lightweight services that can spin up quicker. And by not scaling up your entire application, you can save on hosting costs as well. Um, what I'm describing is, of course, microservices, uh, the idea of taking a focused microservice and decoupling it from the rest of that application, and then using a, a messaging service or um, a message broker to communicate between all the different microservices. Um, the log logical evolution of this methodology is, uh, has led to a technology that we've been reaching for more and more uh, and that is serverless functions. Uh, a service serverless function doesn't necessarily represent a whole service, but a unit of work, um, but spe built specifically for scalability, built with scalability in mind. So I'll give you another example. We had a website uh, that, for all intents and purposes, was a you know, content-driven site built on Embraco Cloud. Uh, the client wanted us to be able to trigger off campaigns where they would send out half a million coupon codes uh, to their customers and direct them to a page on the website um, in order to redeem and find out whether they had won a prize. Now, we didn't want to set up uh, aggressive scaling on the whole website, 
But we also didn't want angry phone calls saying that people weren't able to redeem their coupons. So we turned to serverless functions. Uh, as more and more requests came in, the functions were able to scale up to meet that demand uh, without adding any additional strain to the rest of the website. Uh, although this story does come with a bit of a warning, uh, make sure that you have sensible limits on how far you want your uh, serverless functions to scale. Um, otherwise, you can end the month with a pretty scary bill. OK, I believe I'm running out of time, so I'm going to have to, yes, I'm going to have to skip some sections, um, which is great, because you probably all know about headless. You know I can't, well, people that know me know I can't finish a talk without talking about headless. But this principle is the same. Um, instead of having Umbraco do everything, you let Umbraco manage its content, and you serve that content over a API, and you let your front-end developers work in the environment that they are most happy with. It's hardcore. You might know about it. So I really quickly want to finish with a, a project that we recently launched uh, where we're able to incorporate some of the elements I'm talking about. This is Smooth. Uh, we built it with a custom build of Umbraco and a front end using Nuxt. Um, it was headless, serverless, so I generated. Um, we got some pretty good uh, improvements on page speed compared to our, another Umbraco 9 build. Um, one thing we didn't have was HTTP2, so I feel like we could have bumped those numbers a little bit. We were able to deploy it on a CDN. So those page speeds were represented across the world. And oh, I've run out of time. But it's cheaper to run on, uh, on headless. £82.53 is what I estimated for a standard Umbraco build. With headless, uh, we brought that down to you know, £42 uh, a month. And I've even included something like 50 million serverless calls in there, just for good luck. Um, sweet. OK. In summary, I had a happy client, happy developers, and I get to know that we built a website that was able to scale with the client and their needs. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. And yeah. <laughs>